Uh, good, uh, good, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, like Ruchi just said, I'm not a morning person either. So <laughs> it's a bit like bl bl uh, blurry today, uh, this morning. So it's good that Ruchi already laid out all the constructivist theoretical framework that <laughs> I might not have to uh, touch upon in details. So today I'm going to, uh, let me briefly talk about this project. Actually, this is like my prelim preliminary idea about the new projects I'm trying to work on in the next probably in a year, year or two. So this is quite sketchy and not well formulated. I have to be modest about this. So uh, your suggestions and comments would be uh, welcome uh, for improving this project. Uh, when we look at the a sinotype relation, um, you know, the general overlook, uh, overview of this relation is quite you know, warm, close, and quite smooth. Uh, you don't really see any conflict in the public you know, between the Thai and the Chinese, I mean, in the international arenas. And interestingly, uh, the two leaders recently, like frequently, uh, adopt some expressions to represent their uh, in a relation close tight. It normally it's like the Thai Thai Jin Chai Yun Gai Pinong Gan or in Chinese, Jong Tai Jia Qin. When translated in Chi in, in English is the Chinese and the Thai are all the same family. So I'm interested in these uh, expressions of uh, the relationship of the Sino Thai relation. Uh, because one interesting point is that no other countries that I found using this kind of uh, family image or identity to describe their relations. Because in the, you know, some of you might know that the international, modern international system, states supposed to be in an equal basis. So by adopting the family uh, type of identity or image, it means you put yourself in the hierarchy. It means like who's actually a brother, uh, elder brother, who's younger brother. So even Singapore, with the majority ethnic Chinese, uh, Lee Kuan Yew, st uh, like since they started contact with the Communist China in the late 1980s, uh, told Chinese leaders all the time that uh, Singapore is not a kin man's country of China, and Singapore would not act so. And normally in diplomatic interaction, the Singaporean leader and diplomat would use English, not uh, Mandarin, to to talk with the, the Chinese counterpart. <clears throat> so that Singapore case like, reflects um, the quite a strict modern state system and diplomatic interaction. Uh, so the Thai, in, Thai case is quite interesting why the Thai leaders choose to publicly adopt this kinship image between Thailand and China all the time. So when we look at comparative, uh, at, at a comparative perspective between uh, sino thai relations. Uh, we see, as I mentioned earlier, we see normally the relationships get improved all the time. Since the post-Cold War, we, have no, uh, we don't see any conflict in the international arenas. Or if, even though there, 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 there were conflict, but conflict might be like you know, hidden behind the scene. We don't see it. Compared to the Thai-US relations, it up and down, sometimes just you know, neutral. So, this experience tell us something that what actually determines the outcome of this relationship, this pair relationship. Actually, like, take it back a little bit because this study is part of the comparative study between Sino-Thai relations and US-Thai relations. So this part is going to be only uh, Sino-Thai. <coughs> so me, of course, both have mutual interests. And what Ruti said, uh, you know, rationalist approach would Think that all mutual uh, interest, material in, materialist interest, would determine the relationship. But then, when we look at this, you know, kind of expression, a Thai Jin Pi Nong Gan or Thai and Chinese are family. Is there anything like in between that the policymakers actually think and determine the differences of the relationship, the outcome of the relationship? Uh, since he cover a lot. And I would mention like briefly, the scholar with international relations have, have for some time thought about the influence of ideas in policy maker, uh, making. And one type of idea is state perception of uh, itself 
and others. Uh, for example, like we are friends, you are family, you are of my friends, you are my enemies. Um, these beliefs actually frequently rest on deeply biased understanding of national history that dominate perception of the past and underlie strategic assessment uh, of the present and future. So this ideational factor informs spe specific foreign policy decisions um, and form the basis for broad orientation, whether it's alignment, non-alignment, or you know, opposition. So they act as a mental shortcut to decide which type of foreign policy response one state should pursue uh, in the first place, sometimes regardless of the mutual interest or material interest or the other state intention. So one way to investigate such, um, such an ideational inference is looking through the use of language. So language constitutes political reality uh, as it is a tool to convey uh, ideas and value in society. So therefore language, whether official or private, rhetorical or observational, has a lot to tell us about uh, the mindset and action of the state. With this uh, observational and theoretical background, so I want to examine the, you know, the main question is whether images or identity play any role in Thai foreign relations with China and in the whole project with the United States. And you know, the sub-questions are like what, what kind of image that we can see in this relationship and then I, I just uh, you know, trying to test with these uh, family image between Thailand and China, and how are these image, you know, or identity constructed through times? And at this later stage, I was just uh, trying to figure it out if the image influenced the way in which the Thai policy elites actually view China or the United States and that relationship, or and eventually if it determine or shape the direction of the Sino-Thai and U.S.-Thai relation. At, you know, at current state and the future. The conventional wisdom, remember like the phrase Tai uh, Jin Pinongan or Tai the Chinese family, um, signifying the close tie between the two. So the conventional explanation goes that uh, close tie between China and Thailand are grounded in historical contact with a combination of his, his historical contact and material interest especially since the uh, cooperation in the Cambodia conflict in the 1980s. So, but the record also showed that the Chinese had already traded with, with uh, Southeast Asia prior to the establishment of the Thai Kingdom in the Zhao Pia River Plain. Uh, and you know, the Thai uh, like Siamese king or the Thai king regularly sent the missionary uh, to the Chinese imperial court uh, would continue until the, the reign of King Mongkut. And the Chinese have also migrated into this area for centuries. So the large community of Chinese in Ayutthaya uh, were recorded or documented by a lot of uh, you know, European missionaries. And the Chinese also play various roles in Thai political economy as the middleman in trade with China and the tax collection and later on as a laborer. So many of which have successfully uh, entered into Thai uh, bureaucracy through intermarriage with local Thais. So the official contact uh, between the Chinese court, uh, the Siamese court and the imperial court of China were disrupted by the Western power during the 19th century <coughs> until the Cold War when you know, it's actually eventually re-emerged uh, during the 1970s and deepened in the Com Cambodia conflict and later on in the post-Cold War uh, period, uh, you know, like the economic in in interest uh, dominates this uh, relationship. And in fact, like eventually Thailand become a key, key uh, player in Southeast Asia that uh, trying to socialize uh, China or, uh, you know, like bring China to Southeast Asia. So, uh, you know, the, Ch the Chinese will um, will use the, you know, the Thai side as the, the middleman to amend the relationship with the mainland South, uh, with the Southeast Asian state in the post-Cold War period. However, if you look more closely, s certainly the Thai and the Chinese have um, you know, engaged in trade and relations since the 14th century. However, it doesn't mean that Chinese would 
see the Thais or the Siamese kingdoms as their family. If you look at the world view of China, Siams or Thailand uh, was actually in the peripheral area and it was even regarded as barbarian in the south. So the highest status that Siam might attain is like a small kingdom or tri tributary state to, to China that sent you know, tri uh, tribute to China every, every year or every other year. So from the Chinese perspective, it's impossible to, uh, to imagine that the imperial China would view Siam as its family of the coast type. So, and I believe this view of, uh, of uh, the peripheral or the barbarian view of, 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 of the Thai actually continue until quite modern day. And I will touch upon this uh, briefly at the end, toward the end of the, my presentation. So contrary to the popular understanding of the brotherhood image or in family image between uh, China and Thailand, in fact, the Thai state uh, was re also relatively ambivalent in recognizing the Chinese on the same par as well, uh, in its especially in its major narrative. So for most part in the Thai society, if you are Thai, you, you were Thai, you, you were supposed to be under Sakdina system, a feudal system. It means you are pride and you have to have a lord to give you protections. So the Chinese uh, were out of this system. So in, the, in terms of social system, the Chinese were not part of this of Thainess in, in the Thai societies. So despite the long history of intermarriage between the two groups, the Chinese remains, still remain the other until they actually assimilated into, the, into this Thai socio-legal structure. It means they have to either become a lord themselves and they become pride themselves. So and many Chinese merchants successfully enter into this uh, you know, Thai social system by you know, servicing to Siamese court as the middleman in trade and, or the tax collection. So many adopted Thai identity, Thai name, uh, and formal practices and norms in, for you know, securing their, their economic and political privilege in, 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 in the kingdoms. So the divide between the Chinese and the Thai uh, were also reinforced in the 19th century when the West came into Thailand and uh, signed the, uh, the unequal treaty with, with Siam. So that a lot of uh, Chinese went for these colonial for the uh, went to this colonial master to to seek for the protection, so a lot of the Chinese migrants came to Siam to become a, a colonial subject protected by this extra territory right. Uh, moreover, the Thai state at the same times also has a suspicion on the Chinese all the time along the history. So many Chinese group control major econo economic activity in Siam especially trade, export, plantation, port, port operation, and banking later on. Uh, moreover, many, many development in the uh, 19th century and 20th century also put the Chinese as one of the challenge to the Siam's or Thailand's uh, internal security. You know, many of them engaged in illegal activities such as running opium dent or gambling house and extorting the protection fee. So sometimes there were conflicts between clan groups and you know, what we call Ang Yi uh, during the, you know, the early period of the, the Bangkok period. So these kind of um, conflict actually sometimes uh, escalated into riots in Bangkok and other ports area. So actually the Chinese community uh, will view as a threat to uh, the security of the state. Many, many new immigrants also sought colonial protection, as I just mentioned briefly. Therefore, the Thai state could not regulate or these, these you know, uh, Chinese community effectively. Later, the state also concerned about the Republican idea during the uh, Qing Dynasty Revolution, uh, the Sun Yat-sen's idea of republic in China that connects to a lot of overseas Chinese in, in Southeast Asia, including Thailand. So uh, the Thai state look at, you know, very carefully look at this, this group as one of the, the, the threat. So similar to the security concern uh, was also reappear again in, in, 
in the World War II because the China, because Thailand were siding with the, the Japanese and then automatically the overseas Chinese who still uh, Chinese national were part of the, the enemy in the war. So, and later on during the Cold War, you know, after the, the Communist Party take, took over uh, mainland China and the Chinese uh, government supported uh, communist movement in Southeast Asia, including Thailand. So the Chinese community will view with the suspicion all the time by the, by the Thai state. Therefore, the Chinese in Thailand were subject to uh, state monitoring, uh, control, and regulations. This is evident in the anti-Chinese uh, sentiment and policy throughout the late 19th century until 20th century, uh, including King Rama uh, the Sixth or King Wachira with anti-Chinese sentiment or people in government during the war and especially during the peak of the Cold War. So it has a long period of the suspicion on the Chinese. Under these circumstances, the Thai state forced the Chinese, for example, to nationalize into Thai uh, adopt Thai name, seize uh, the Chinese practices, and even education, Chinese education, or even nationalize uh, their businesses. So within this context, it can be seen that uh, the family image could not easily uh, emerge out of, uh, out of a smooth relation that the conventional wisdom always claimed. <clears throat> so in parallel to this attempt to formally control and regu regulate uh, of the Chinese. However, the, the Thai state also opted for a soft strategy to uh, manage the Chinese concern through constructing cultural affinity with the, uh, the Chinese at the same time. So in short, this was a strategy, strategy to consolidate the Thai state itself. After the fall of UT, uh, many of you might know that King Tat Singh also, you know, when he wanted to, to reestablish the tributary trade with China, he himself, well, of course, he's a Chinese, uh, has Chinese background. He himself referred to himself with Chinese name to the imperial court. And even though uh, after King Tat Singh, the Thai king also have Chinese name, even after the, the tributary trade uh, seed see it uh, in the, during the reign of King Rama uh, the fourth of King Mongkut. So, but afterward, they always you know, adopt the Chinese name. They name themselves with Chinese. So this is understandable in the fact that, that as adopting an identity as part of the Middle Kingdom's you know, political, cultural world was a foreign policy strategy for the new kingdom to re regain political recognition uh, and tributary trade benefit with the overlord, which is China. So how would Siam distance uh, China after the last tributary trade in the early reign of King Mongkut, and the presence of the European power in Asia became a new reality uh, in which Siamese elites need to deal with. So despite the de decline of the Pax, uh, this is another example of you know, like how the, Thai, the, the Thai elite, King Mongkut, King Jula, and some of the princes, uh, dressed up in Chinese and you know, like, with the, have the painting in, in Chinese costume. <clears throat> so despite the decline of Pax Sinica, the Siamese court um, did not totally abandon uh, the affinity with the Chinese culture or the Chinese world. Uh, the Thai elites have embraced um, some of Chinese practices into the regular uh, ritual and ceremony uh, since King Rama, Rama the, the, the fourth of King Mongkut, such as Chinese style of um, funeral ceremony or uh, ancestral worshiping. This is like one of a picture. This is the ancestral uh, altar of the Jaki dynasty, dynasty, dynasty in the Bang in Summer Palace. And every year during Chinese New Year, there will be uh, ancestral worshiping ceremony uh, at this palace, as well as in Bangkok. And the king, I found this picture that you know, he burned the Chinese, uh, you know, paper money uh, during the Chinese New Year. So as in current time, Crown Prince and his family did that. And this is uh, the, you call it, uh, Chinese funeral ceremony in the reign of King Rama V, uh, Gong Tek, the ceremony to, to dedicate to the, the, the deceased person. And it still happened today when uh, the king's 
uh, mother pass away and the princess you know like perform this uh, ceremony all at, uh, at the same times. So by performing Chinese practices, the Siamese court attempted to gain a legitimacy over this uh, new social group and to secure its governability amidst the uh, threat of the colonization. So Thai, the Thai state started to demonstrate uh, the recognition of the family image between the Chinese and uh, the Thai, again, officially. Is this like, I don't know if this is the first time. I'm not sure. Probably a Dan Tong Chai might know better. Uh, this is the first time when the Thai elite and the Thai court expressed with this phrase that the Thai and Chinese are brother. Uh, when the, uh, the King Pachatipok visited the uh, Chinese community in Bangkok, and he said, like, you know, we are brothers. So in his speech during this visit, actually, it was held by uh, Prince Dambrong, who actually wrote this speech for him. So this was a strategy to cement the racial relationship and mobilize the Chinese support to the state affair uh, during the economic difficulty in the, in the reign. So the post-revolutionary -revol uh, government before the Second World War also continued the same strategy despite its nationalist tendency. So this, the Thai state popularized Kun Vijit Madras version of historical narrative that the Thai race you know, migrated from the Altai area and passed through China. So we have relationship, we mix with the Chinese, and eventually we actually are elder brother of the Chinese. So that quite, that, despite the, 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 you know, the nationalist uh, sentiment during these regimes, we can see that the Chinese identity and Thai identity can, can nicely fit because, you know, uh, probably like some of the elite might have thought that actually we are brother kind of clan of the Chinese, the, you know, like a, the mega Chinese uh, or the mega clan. So this, ver this version, uh, so it's not difficult, I just said it's not difficult for Thai state to incorporate this Chinese identity uh, within the rubric of the Thai identity itself. So another sample that I might uh, show you briefly is this is, I found this song uh, it's actually composed by uh, Luang Wichit uh, It's a song in the 1937 as part of the stage play about King Pak Sin. Uh, and in this uh, play, it demonstrates the unity of different races that helped save the nation during the early Bangkok period, uh, before Bangkok period, after the fall of Utia. So the, the song portrayed the brotherhood and mutual support between the Chinese and the Thai cultivated through time. Therefore, it can be said that this, uh, within this political context, after the overthrow of the monarchy, uh, this attempt was the part of Thai state trying to seek Chinese community support to the nation building in the new regime. Therefore, the sentiment can help deepen uh, the relationship between the two races and was deemed necessary. <coughs> However, during the, the World War II, as I mentioned, uh, the relationship was kind of declined because of the Cold War conflict, but it reemerged or gained or deepened uh, during the, the 1980s uh, when they cooperated in the Cambodia conflict. So uh, after, uh, around this time, this family image reemerged to represent a close tie again. So I found one speech of the Prime Minister Cha Chai Shun Hwan that he mentioned this phrase again in the, 19, in the late 1980s in, during his visit to China. So my understanding is that the use of the image in Thai as, is a Thailand's tool or strategy to socialize China in the modern time. So during the 80s, it's like kind of confirmation of their, their close relationship and China's support to its policy in Cambodia conflict. And uh, in the early 1990s on, this image helped strengthen economic relations and the fun function of uh, 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 Be Beijing's support to the Thai, Thai government. So until this point, we, we don't see any same echo or the same sentiment that the Chinese actually see the Thai as a family, as I mentioned, that you know, we are, the Chinese think that they are the Middle Kingdom and the Thai are per peripheral and barbarian. Um, at this stage, we don't see the conformity, like what Bridget told, me, told us about the theoretical framework. Non-conformity happened. Look at the early 1990s speech of the, prime, uh, the former Prime Minister Brain. He, in his speech to Li Peng, uh, he used 
this inlet or identity to, to just, you know, like uh, kind of smoothen the conversation. But the responsibility Peng has nothing. It has to be with fundamental interest. Everything is about interest. They don't respond in, you know, in the same line with the, with the brain. However, the Thai has uh, tirelessly, tirelessly introduced and reproduced this kind of uh, image uh, to represent a good tie with China all the time. Uh, there has been more evidence you know, that Thailand has used this family image in the promotion of close tie. But this princess, <coughs> Prince, Prince Irinton has uh, studied Chinese for a long time, and his, uh, her um, frequent visit to China has amended uh, relations between the two. And even later on, she, she was named that uh, she was the best friend of, of China by the uh, Chinese uh, people. And Prince Jula Pong, <laughs> he's very talented. And uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, she, she has this concert uh, playing Chinese instrument. Um, started in 2001. And since then, it has been uh, run or you know like shown for six times. Uh, yeah, this this is the fifth time that she stayed you know with another musician from China. So at least the public you know at this stage we we, we don't see that the official acceptance of this Chinese, uh, family image yet. But at least a public promotion of these two princes uh, princesses you know in China roughly show that China accept to go along with this image uh, that the Thai leader is trying to construct and impose as a core identity between this relationship. Uh, another speech by, by Xi Jinping, uh, at that time he was a vice president when he was visiting, uh, was visiting the, well, Thailand during that time. He started to use, this is one of the first time that we see the Chinese leader start to adopt exactly the same uh, sentiments of phrase to mention about the close tie between the two. So I still doubt whether uh, this acceptance of the Chinese uh, form, form, form from the Chinese side is merely a, a nice gesture to a Thai diplomatic gesture. But uh, this suggests that uh, at a stage, uh, you know, a, a certain degree of Thai policy elite kind of successfully uh, framed the normative environment of the bilateral relation and uh, later on, we see a lot of senior official from China use this, uh, this exactly the same phrase uh, frequently. So at this point, I would like to just um, draw the possible answer to my previous questions uh, that I you know, set out earlier, that the family image constitutes a normative order in which uh, Thailand perceives itself as having a kindred affiliation with China. And this family image corresponds to the pre-existing hierarchical order, a social order, as a family member stirring up a conflict actually violate family norms. And this has an important implication uh, in recent foreign policy, where Thailand is likely to maintain good ties with Beijing uh, through the post-Cold War uh, period. Or to speak in IR term, we can see that Thailand actually has a tendency to bandwagon uh, rather than balance uh, China influence in the in the region. So this is the end of my presenta uh, presentation, and uh, your feedback would be uh, very welcome. Thank you.